Assalamu alaikum wa wabarakatuh. My name is Dr. Abir Khoja. I'm a neurology assistant professor in neurology department at King Abdul Aziz University. Today, I will talk about headlines in common neurological diseases. So uh, uh, in my talk, I'm going to cover the following outlines. We will talk about stroke and transient ischemic attack, primary headaches, epilepsy, and status epilepticus, uh, dif uh, the difference between dementia and delirium, uh, multiple sclerosis, criteria of, ma of diagnosis and management, uh, we will talk briefly about Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and finally about myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barré syndrome. So starting with the stroke, so stroke is defined as sudden of loss of blood circulation to an area of the brain. So that will result in loss of the neurological function of the corresponding artery. It can be either ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, and the ischemic stroke either can be thromb uh, thrombotic or cardioembolic uh, occlusion of the cerebral artery. So how these patients present? The most important uh, part in the presentation is an abrupt onset, meaning that uh, the symptoms reach the maximum within second to minutes, and it can present either with motor, sensory, visual, or language manifestations. And that will be according to the artery involved. So for example, if the artery involved is the anterior cerebral artery, the patient will present with motor and sensory deficit in the leg more than face and arm. However, if the patient have an MCA or mid-cerebral artery occlusion, they will have motor and sensory manifestation in face more than arm, more than leg, more than foot. That is because what we call it a homunculus distribution of the body on the brain. And also another important to keep in your mind, if the involved vessel, it's dominant or non-dominant hemisphere. So in the dominant hemisphere, the patient will present with language impairment in the form of aphasia. However, in the non-dominant hemisphere, they will have neglect. What about if it is more of penetrating vessel or small vessel? So we it will cause what we call it lacunar stroke. So we'll have, we have around five lacunar syndromes. And if it is uh, posterior circulation more posteriorly in the term of uh, vestibular basilar artery. So it will cause more cranial nerve involvement and disequilibrium. Uh, so how we diagnose these patients? So we have what we call it a golden hour for evaluating and treating patient with acute stroke. So at the time we are suspecting a patient with a focal neurological deficit, this is the zero time and from uh, uh, zero time until uh, in less than 10 minutes, we should evaluate the patient, including the history and the lab work. In less than 15 minutes, stroke team should be notified. In less than 25 minutes, CT scan should be initiated. And in less than 45 minutes, CT and lab should be inter interpreted. And in less than 60 minutes, the patient, if uh, uh, eligible, should have the TPA. Why is that? Because always we say time is brain. So how we approach the patient in the ER? So first we make sure of the stability of the patient. We should take a focused history about the last time patient seen well. And this is the most important question when we ask the patient, what is the last time patient was seen well? What, it's not about the symptoms onset. Why is that? Because uh, sometimes a patient is waking up at 5 a.m. with the symptoms. So this is not meaning the last seen well. The last seen well, the time before patient went to sleep. After that, is it sudden or gradual? Is it persistent or improved? Is there any TPA contraindication? So what are the TPA contraindications? Any history of increasing risk of bleeding. So for example, history of head trauma, history of extracranial trauma, previous history of intracranial hemorrhage, suspected subarachnoid hemorrhage, neoplasm, AV malformation, intracranial or intraspinal surgery, any history of arterial puncture in non-compressible site, and history of uh, GI or genitourinary bleeding. 
The most important also, if there is any active internal bleed, uh, any uh, other of the mark of the uh, INR, PT, PTT platelets that increasing the risk of bleeding. And if CT showing hypodensity in more than one third of the hemisphere, meaning that already the infarction established. What about the systolic or the blood pressure in general and blood glucose? So we should keep the patient. Uh, so if the systolic blood pressure more than 185 over 110, this is a contraindication to give TPA. However, it, we call it a relative because if we control the blood pressure, we can give the TPA. And the same for the blood glucose, because if it uh, after correcting the hypoglycemia and the patient is still having the symptoms, they should treat it with TPA. After that, in the assessment, so we should make sure of the oxygenation, blood pressure, uh, sorry, blood glucose, as we mentioned, uh, blood pressure uh, uh, for the patient candidate for TPA should be less than 185 over 110. And uh, heart rate, we should make sure it's regular, irregular. And uh, if the patient having uh, any uh, uh, fever to rule out infective endocarditis. After that, we should uh, do what we call it NIH stroke scale. So what is NIH stroke scale? It's a scale uh, to indicate the severity of the stroke. So the scale is uh, more of a, a physical examination with um, uh, scores. So for example, uh, we will test the level of consciousness, uh, ability to be oriented uh, uh, in answering two questions, response to commands and the gaze, uh, visual field, facial movements, motor examination with keeping the drift uh, for the upper limb for 10 seconds and the lower limbs for five seconds. Uh, the presence of ataxia, sensory involvement, after that, the language. And in the language, we use the uh, uh, NIH uh, stroke scale language examination. This is what we call it, cookie theft picture. We have here the reading, uh, here testing for uh, difficult words to check for the dysarthria, and here's the naming. And after that, we calculate the final score. So if this, the score is zero, meaning that we don't have stroke sim symptoms, if this from one to four, this is a minor stroke, five to 15, moderate stroke, 16 to 20, moderate to severe, from 21 until 42, this is severe stroke. So after that, we have to have an emergent brain imaging, which is non-contrast CT scan. And it's the most uh, commonly used uh, neuroimaging to evaluating the patient. And the importance of that to exclude underlying, the presence of underlying hemorrhagic stroke. So other than that, we can do a CT. Uh, so this is the non-contrast or non-enhanced CT brain. We can do a CT cerebral angio for the uh, va uh, arterial uh, uh, supply of the brain. We can also do what we call a CT perfusion. It can be helpful to differentiate core and penumbra and helping also in thrombectomy or the patient who present with wake-up or stroke. Uh, later on, not in acute phase, can, we can do carotid Doppler ultrasound and finally conventional angio if needed uh, for specific patients. What about the laboratory studies? In the laboratory studies, we can do CBC as a basic lab works, including the platelets, a basic panel, chemistry panel for uh, to ruling out uh, stroke mimickers like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia. Uh, coagulation profile, as we mentioned before, it's a contraindication for TPA. Cardiac biomarkers, because sometimes it's associated with uh, uh, the uh, coronary artery disease. Toxicology screen, especially in younger population, because sometimes some kind of the stimulant can cause stroke-like symptoms. Uh, also, pregnancy to indicate uh, in case of TPA and lumbar puncture, but this is not in the acute stroke management. This required if we are uh, would like to rule out meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the CT scan was negative. After that, uh, the treatment options, so either fibrinolytic therapy, the tissue plasminogen, the TPA, mechanical thrombectomy, or antiplatelet if the patient is not within the window for TPA, or not candidate for TPA. 
So what about if the patient presenting with an acute focal neurological deficit within 4.5 hours, this is the time uh, we give that TPA, and there was no contraindication. So sometimes before we give, we insert NG2, uh, NG2 full catheter securing IV line, and we give the ultiplase 0.9 milligram per kg and not exceeding, or the maximum dose is 90 milligram. So meaning if the patient weight more than 100, so the maximum will be 90 milligram. So from this 90 milligram or whatever the dose depend on the weight, we will take 10% infusion over a minute and the rest over one hour. If we have the other option, which is which is called tenecteplase, so it have another uh, doses, uh, uh, again, it's per kg. So what about if the patient is outside the window or not candidate for TPA? So we should uh, uh, keep the blood pressure high to uh, as a way or mechanism to help to reperfuse the area. And uh, we can monitor for the rest of uh, the parameters. If the patient have a minor stroke, meaning less than four, uh, the NIH stroke less than four, or the patient is not a stroke, is a TIA, and that we'll talk about later. So in minor stroke, in minor stroke, we can give a patient loading of aspirin and Plavix with maintenance of both antiplatelets for three weeks, then con uh, continue on single antiplatelet. All these patients will, uh, will have a DVT prophylaxis, GI prophylaxis, swallowing assessment, occupational therapy, and physical therapy referral. So what about if the patient is uh, already received uh, the IV TPA? So after 24 hours, we repeat the CT brain, we make sure that the, there is no hemorrhage and we can start the aspirin. So what about if the patient had a large vessel disease, meaning uh, that is either uh, internal carotid artery, proximal mediastinal artery, and the patient was uh, already received TPA, but there is a clear large vessel occlusion, so we can do what we call it thrombectomy. So in these patients, there are more extended window for uh, with different studies. Uh, we have down, diffuse, and urea. So the maximum until 24 hour, if the patient uh, having uh, the patient age more than 18, in I just stroke scale more uh, than six to eight, uh, pre uh, pre stroke was the patient uh, MR uh, score between zero to one, meaning that the patient functionally independent. We can take the patient to uh, uh, thrombectomy, uh, to the angio suite for thrombectomy. So uh, now we will talk about uh, transient ischemic attack. So what do we mean by TIA or transient, or transient ischemic attack? So the old definition was clinically based, meaning that if we have a brief episode of neurological dysfunction in less than 24 hours resulting from a focal uh, temporary cerebral ischemia, we call it TIA. But since 2009, the new definition is tissue-based. So meaning that the transient episode of neurological dysfunction should be uh, seen uh, in the MRI brain without clearly or definite infarction. What does that mean? So that is mean when we are seeing the MRI, we can found uh, restricted uh, diffusion on uh, some sequence of the MRI without definite infarction, meaning that we see it on diffusion ADC map without T2 flare. So what are the differential diagnoses of transient ischemic attack? Or what are the differential diagnoses of any focal, uh, uh, transient focal uh, neurological deficit? So when you're talking about any 
transient focal neurological symptoms. We think about the first or top differential diagnosis is the transient ischemic attack. The second is um, uh, post-ectal totsparesis. The third is migraine with aura. The fourth is due to any electrolyte disturbances. And uh, the, uh, the least on the list is due to psychogenic uh, and it's not an organic uh, underlying etiology. So when we are assessing a patient with a transient ischemic attack, we are looking for a score called ABCD2 score. So this is a score to predict the risk of stroke within the next two days. So for example, if the patient got from the score one to three, so this is less than or around 1% the risk of stroke, so this is a low risk. If it is, uh, uh, if the score between six to seven, so this patient high risk and the risk of stroke is 8% in the next two days. So what is this ABCD2 score? So A stand for the age. If the age uh, uh, more than 60, the patient will have one point. The blood pressure, if the systolic more than 140 or the systolic more than 190, patient will have one score. The clinical presentation, if the patient have unilateral weakness, so this will patient will have two scores. If there's just a speech without weakness, one, diabetes, one, and the duration of the symptoms. So. The importance of this score to decide for the need of admission and uh, uh, doing the investigation in hospital in comparison to discharging the patient and doing as outpatient. So the treatment, as we mentioned, in case of minor stroke or transient ischemic attack, we will give loading aspirin plavix and maintaining on both uh, for three weeks or uh, 21 days, then on single antiplatelet, according to the underlying etiology. So this in case if it is atherosclerotic, if the underlying etiology is thromboembolic, so that means we will start anticoagulation. So the next topic, we'll talk about headache. So we have primary headache and secondary headache. The most common uh, primary uh, types of primary headache is migraine, tension time headache, and cluster headache. The most important in determining the underlying uh, or to diagnose uh, the type of headache is detailed history and examination. So I'll start with migraine. Migraine is a neurological disorder due to hyperexcitability of the nervous system. It's chronic with episodic manifestation. It's uh, due to both environmental and genetic susceptibility. It affecting women more than men, white more than African and Asians. So what are the type of migraine? We have migraine with aura, we have migraine without aura, chronic migraine, probable migraine, episodic syndrome that may be associated with migraine. <clears throat> so for the aura, we have the classical visual, sensory, speech, language, uh, brainstem aura, retinal aura, or hemiplegic aura. And we have a complication from the migraine. So we have status migranosis when the migraine more than 72 hours. We have persistent aura without infarction, meaning that the aura lasting more than a week without evidence of infarction on the MRI. We have what we call migranous infarction, meaning that the aura persisting more than 60 minutes with evidence of infarction related to the same presenting uh, aura. And we have migraine, aura triggered seizures, and this seizure occurring during the attack or within one hour after. So what are the stages of migraine? So if we can classify it into four to five stages. So normally we have a normal appetite, normal sleep, uh, sleep wake cycle, uh, light tolerance, noise, fluid balance. In the prodrome, what will happen? So the patient might have more craving to food. Uh, they feel tired, uh, yawning. Uh, they cannot tolerate light and noise. They will have some fluid retention. After that, the aura can start. And uh, the patient will have at this time more of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, might feel sleepy, uh, more photophobia and phonophobia. And after that, and this is the phase associated also after the aura with the headache. 
In the resolution phase, the patient might have vomiting or deep sleep. And after that, in the recovery will be limited for food tolerance. Or they will feel tired. They might feeling uh, also again intolerant to the light and noise. So the prodrome, around 60% of the patient feel it in the, in the previous 24 to 48 hour. And uh, the aura is more of complex uh, symptoms preceding the headache. It can be in the form of positive or negative symptoms, and it occur in around 25% of the patients. And it's longer range between five to 20 minutes, uh, and uh, but less, lasting less than 60 minutes. It can be either visual, as visual field defect, central scotoma, some scoto uh, scotoma and colored uh, uh, in the form of like flashes of light and can be sensory, speech and trouble recalling the words, understanding and or in reading and writing or the least uh, between the auras, which is the motor symptoms. In the prodrome, as we mentioned, the patient will feel tired, irritable, myalgia, anorexia, or uh, food cravings. So uh, how we diagnose patient with migraine? According to the International Headache Society Diagnostic Criteria, so migraine without aura, we will have at least five attacks fulfilling the criteria. The headache should last between four to 72 hours, and the headache should have at least two of the following four characteristics. Unilateral in location, so it's not a must always. Pulsatile in quality, moderate or severe pain intensity, aggravating or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. And this is one of the very most important in term of the migraine headache. And during the headache, uh, we'll have at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia, and no other explanation for this headache. And the uh, types of the aura, as we mentioned before, chronic migraine. So chronic migraine when the headache is more than 15 days per month for three months, or occurring in a patient who had at least five attacks uh, uh, and uh, fulfilling uh, the criteria between uh, B to D for the migraine without aura, the one we mentioned, or the migraine with aura. Uh, if it is eight days or more for more than three months, and it's already fulfilled the previous criteria, we can consider it also as chronic migraine. So the goal in management, these are, this disorder is a chronic disabling disorder. So we want to restore the function, reduce the disability. So we have to start with lifestyle modification, non-pharmacological uh, treatment, then abortive medications and preventive medications. So in term, during the acute attack, we have the specific like tryptans or glutamine. We have the new medication, which is the anti seizure RPs medication. Uh, we have the non-specific like uh, anti-steroidal uh, opioids, anti-emetic medication. Uh, the principle in treating, we should treat the attack early and should be not exceeding two to three times a day, uh, two to three days per week. After that, the patient either will develop medication overuse headache or already at the stage of chronic migraine. So these are the options for the non-specific, the NSAIDs and, and the specific tryptans. And uh, tryptans, just you should be careful with the patient with uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes, obesity, uncontrolled hypertension. And it's again, and it's also contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, these are all the available somatroptans, olmetroptan, and they have oral, some of them intranasal, uh, and this, these are the doses. And we have orgutamine with the same contraindication for vascular disease, and the NSAIDs group, uh, neuroleptics, and uh, after that, uh, we will talk about the principle for preventive therapy. So preventive therapy, we consider it when uh, um, we have two a severe or disabling or four less disabling uh, migraine attacks per month. The acute migraine treatment is ineffective or contraindicated. The presence of uh, medication overuse headache, they're highly disabling migraine or the patient preference. So what are the options for preventive therapy? We have some of the beta blockers group, 
uh, antidepressant, anti-emetics, neurotoxin, and we have the anti-CGRP injection and oral medication. So uh, so these are some of the groups. So we have valboric acid, topiramate, amitriptyline, uh, propranolol, all can be given, and the neurotoxin, which is the botox, which give um, uh, uh, relief in up to three to six months, and uh, uh, we, it should be repeated after that. Uh, now we will move on to the trigeminal uh, autonomic cephalgias. They are a group of primary headache characterized by unilateral trigeminal distribution pain, epsilateral cranial autonomic features. They are all short in duration. We have cluster headache, paroxysmal hemicarina. We have what we call sunct suna, and uh, all these uh, subtypes of trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. The most important between them, the cluster headache, what we call it is uh, what, the other name for it is suicidal headache. It's male predominance. Uh, the prevalence is very rare, less than uh, around 0.1%. Usually they have family history uh, of uh, cluster headache in 5 to 20%, uh, mean age in uh, 28 to 30s. And it's called cluster because it come in one up to eight episodes per day and it come in circadian or uh, um, uh, in a periodic pattern, they have side shift uh, in 15% and it's associated sometimes with some pituitary gland abnormalities. It has some precipitating factor like uh, nitroglycerin, histamine, alcohol, and chocolate. So we diagnose based at least of five criteria, fulfill uh, the uh, descriptions of unilateral orbital headache, uh, lasting for 15 to 180 uh, minutes, associated with one of the following uh, autonomic symptoms, uh, conjunctival injections, lacrimation, nasal congestion, eyelid edema, and the most important part also in that, the restlessness or agitation associated with the headache because of the severity of the pain. So in the acute management, we should give 100% oxygen, 12 to 15 liter per minute for 15 to 20 minutes. Other can be given like triptan, lidocaine, octoriotide um, uh, as subcutaneous. In the chronic or preventive management, verapamil, corticosteroid, lithium, and tupermate can be given. If it is chronic, surgical management can be offered like uh, occipital nerve block, uh, or occipital nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation for posterior inferior hypothalamus. Tension type headache also is of the common, uh, one of the common type of headache and it's usually pressing or tightening lymphocytile bind-like uh, headache. It's in the front occipital location, uh, usually bilateral, mild to moderate in severity and it's not aggravated by physical activity. Usually, we are uh, treating with more non-pharmacological, like cold uh, packs, uh, regular exercises, stretching, balanced meal, good time of sleep, and uh, other, including uh, some sort of um, uh, trigger point injection, occipital nerve block, and some of relaxation techniques. Sinus headache also it's uh, uh, can be presenting. It's a frontal headache accompanied with the pain in one or more region around the sinuses and it's usually uh, um, it's developed simultaneously with the exacerbation of rhinosinusitis and resolved within around seven days of remission. <laughs> 